welcome to A Moment of Bach, a special mini-series on Brandenburg Concerto No. 3. On this podcast, we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth, or even a few seconds, and show you why we think that they are remarkable. This is the last episode in this three-part mini-series. Today, we talk about Brandenburg Concerto No. 3, Movement 3. We are your hosts, Christian and Alex Giebert. Today's moment is a feature of the viola one part from the third movement of Brandenburg III. So this moment is something that Christian and I both picked. Typically, if you've been noticing, Christian and I have been switching off these episodes on which moments we pick and talk about for each episode. So like, I picked the moment for episode one, he did two, I did episode three, he did four, and so on. And it just ended up working out that way. But here we have a little three-part mini-series. And we decided that for the last movement, uh, maybe we should do that one together. And we both ended up picking the same moment anyway, because we both really yep. love this viola solo that happens um, in the latter half of the of the piece here. Yeah. There's such an extended viola solo Bach himself played the viola, and he did like to lead the orchestra from his viola seat. Makes you think, like, wait a minute, who was the conductor? But the thing is that in this time period in history, they typically didn't have a person on a podium with a baton, the way we think of it now. They were much more economical. They just had somebody within the orchestra leading the orchestra. A lot of times this was the keyboardist, so like someone in the middle of the harpsichord might do it, nodding their head up and down. Sometimes it was the first violinist, oftentimes, the person who we would now call the concert master. That person was the first violinist, and they would do it. But it didn't even have to be them. We know that Bach led some things from the viola himself for his own music. And the viola is the instrument that you would least think to be one that would lead. So it just goes to show you that some of our conceptions are not correct about the way we think about how this old music was conducted. Yeah, and on the other hand, there is a violin one solo earlier in the movement that's kind of like that same material that you get in the viola solo later but just kind of slightly altered and that would have been a good thing that somebody could have been leading i mean in this uh in this video we've got Shunsuke Seto the artistic leader of the Netherlands Bach Society we've got him leading the group here yeah so he leads it as violin one yeah definitely so it can be done from anywhere really I mean honestly you could be the third violist and you could still lead this if you if that was your skill it might be easier in fact to lead from a from one of the parts that's not quite as hard although really I mean all these parts are hard but the viola one part would have been a little harder than the viola three probably I mean, certainly they have this one like really tough solo right here that you get to see. Yeah, I mean, there's some th- there's some considerations you could say like maybe the string player all the way to our right side looking at the stage should lead because their instrument is pointing at other people's instrument and the string instruments of the others who are standing with the smaller instruments like violins and violas are not pointing at them. Sometimes it's a matter of hearing. Like actually, I think Shunsky Sato has complained about how he thinks it's so funny in other uh, orchestral concerto videos or something, how sometimes he has to lead the orchestra from all the way over on the right of the orchestra where he is so that he's on his right, you know, the orchestra is on his left. But the way that violins are held, it makes it so that he hears himself mostly, like in his left ear, right? And the left ear is the one that he needs to be hearing the orchestra, but that's the one that's being blocked, Yeah, because of his own sound. So it's tricky. And those of you and us who have played in big ensembles, like I know Alex and I have played in like big uh, concert bands and stuff like that. Right. And I've played horn in a concert band. And that is an exercise in patience and listening because it's hard to just sit back and enjoy the music when you're hearing like 75% one other horn player that sits next to you. You know, you're hearing 20% your own sound and then 5% imbalanced blend of everyone else it's not a musical experience it it is but it's not it's not like being in an audience or something it's not balanced you have to um yeah 
you have to account for it. And it's really interesting. And the way that we do it now is different. And if you go to an orchestra concert and you see somebody on the podium waving a stick around, that's not what it's not what they did. That person is standing in the middle to get optimal balance and can hear things really well. And that's the best seat in the house, I think, the one on the podium. Yeah. <laughs> not a seat. It, but... ne- it needs to be. That person needs yeah. to be able to hear everything perfectly. Right. So it was different in box time. And it's it's uh, it's hard to imagine. I know that that um, this is the way I feel. I think, Alex, you probably feel this way too because you, you're a conductor. We're both conductors. So my favorite thing in the year is like that I get to do is I get to conduct a small orchestra every once in a while. And anytime that happens, I'm like in heaven because I have the best seat in the house. I am on a podium. Everyone is facing me so that I can balance everything. And it's not for me. It's for the audience. And that's what the balance is for. But it's just a different way we do it now. And in box time, it was actually a little bit more holistic and human than what we do now. We almost have this like dictatorial figure on the in the podium. It's almost a romantic, capital R, romantic, like egotistical ideal. And that's sure you have this like have. vision of Beethoven, you know, that, that it probably is partly true uh, that he was this guy, person on the podium. And, you know, his his word was the way you did it. And it was like his, you know, what he was conducting there was like given to him by God. And you have to follow his baton. Otherwise, you're like, you know, you're you're sinning somehow or something. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But like, yeah, the idea of the conductor is this divine figure or at least as this dictatorial figure. Right. I've seen conductors work that way. And I've seen them also not work. And I've, the most inspiring conductors that I've seen have been very exacting and demanding, but not demeaning toward the musicians, even if those musicians are younger musicians. And I, man, I've had so many experiences. I One time I had this, luckily not long-term, but just as, as a short-term, I had a conductor one time and he was very mean and he was good at getting what he want us to do what he wanted. We were a group of high school students and it was a summer arts thing I think if I'm remembering this correctly but he was mean and he was unlikable and he ultimately didn't get from us the sort of thing that you can't capture by, by just by just being technical he ultimately didn't get our respect yeah. and you can honestly hear that coming out of the orchestra you can honestly hear a little bit of resentment from players you can feel that they're not really doing exactly what you want because they don't like you i don't know that that's a that's a very specific um <laughs> problem but i love to see this um interview with shinsuke sato and how he talks about leadership because he talks about it as though he wants the other instrumentalists to be an important part of that an active part of that and how they and how they're even how their opinions are formed and how they leave time in the rehearsal for people to give opinions about the music and ultimately he's the leader, but he doesn't let them just be passive. And he thinks that that would make for a poor result. And I have to say, I really agree with that, especially when you've got professional musicians there. Right. It's very problematic, the trope of a dictatorial director. It mm-hmm. leads to a really scary power dynamic and bad things happen. And it's really an aspect of you know modernism that has led that to come about. And if you go back to the Baroque era, they were doing things in a much more economical way. Yeah, and when you have such a large orchestra, I mean, it's not not that we're saying that we shouldn't have conductors or something like that, but when you have, have yeah, when you have such a large orchestra, and it is important to have that person that's a leader in any circumstance, whether it's a conductor or not, that person who's an inspiring leader, I mean, I, for, for every bad experience I've had, I mean, I've had great ones. I had a summer arts thing where I was um, playing percussion in orchestra with Larry Livingston, who right now is still working at USC, I believe. Um, great conductor and just a very inspiring person. And one thing I took from that was that, hey, if I'm ever going to be a conductor someday, and then it turned out that I would be later on, I thought to myself at the time, if I'm ever going to do this, I need to be somebody who... People don't look up there because they're scared of me or something. I don't think that's really my personality anyway, but people shouldn't look up there because they're scared. If they if they didn't, they would get in trouble. People should look up there because they don't want to miss anything I'm doing. People should look up there because they're inspired. That would be my goal. That's something that I can always aspire to, is to be that kind of conductor. 
Yeah, and they need to see, they want, they need to want to look up to receive meaningful musical information. Yeah, and it's hard to ask that of people, especially amateurs too, because it's easy to just see the conductor as someone to, who's counting time, and that's not, that's really not what the conductor is, especially not for professionals, right? Because for yeah. prof- professional orchestra, they don't even really need that. We talked about entrainment in uh, two episodes ago, right? Once they get started, the orchestra, depending on the piece, sometimes there's a lot of things you can do with tempos and stuff, uh, depending on the piece. But let's say it's a piece like this, where the third movement here, where once you get started, it's like just you're off to the races and it doesn't slow down until the very, very end. If there's something like that, professional orchestras don't need a conductor to beat time in front of them. They just don't need that. There's an old joke that says the only thing that the that a professional musician wants from their conductor is a downbeat and a paycheck. Yeah. Just that first downbeat is all you really need. Just get started. Yeah, sometimes the best thing you can do with an ensemble is to let them find their own moments that they know they should shine in. And yes. kind of like in this podcast, we find the moments that we love, but in a performance setting, you got to know what's the foreground and the background. You know, like that's what delineates the pros from the non-pros. Yeah. And I found something really useful to say to an ensemble the other day where I said, this particular piece that we're working on has a lot of really interesting inner moving lines. So a lot of you who don't always play the melody still have something interesting for just a couple of seconds, right? I'm not going to go through the score right now with you and make you circle every one of them. That would take forever. I need you to find them on your own and bring them out and like take some joy in those musical moments that are just you or, or just you and another person, you know, these things. Yeah. And the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3 is a perfect example of that. It yes. happens all the time. All of a sudden, it'll just be one of those violas doing something. All of a sudden, it'll be the viola three and the violin three in unison. All of a sudden, it'll be three cellos in harmony. It'll just be this magnificent and joyful little kaleidoscope of things. And the players have to know this. Otherwise, you get a completely stale performance of this. Yeah. And the pl- and by telling the players that, you are giving them agency and you are giving them ownership of the music. It's so much better than just telling them, measure 33, viola 1 and 2, piano, viola 3, forte there. Measure 34, viola... You know, like, you're then you're prescribing it for them. Then it's like a prescription. And prescriptions aren't fun, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's better if you let them discover it. And it takes some risks. And then especially if they're younger musicians, if this is not pros we're talking about, I mean, they wouldn't play this piece probably, the Brandenburg one, but unless they were fantastic young musicians, I've seen it done, but... Mm-hmm. But, but it, like, if you're working with intermediate or whatever students and they're at that level where they're ready to start taking some ownership of the music and, and like, understand how to bring out those inner lines and stuff, like what you're talking about, that's such the perfect time to give them that task. It's kind of like when you have older kids watch over younger kids um, as, like, a way to sort of get the older kids to learn how to watch the younger kids. It's more, for, it's, <laughs> it's more like, to help the older kids grow than it is to get the younger kids watched you know what I mean (laughs) like it's it's like that where you're having these kids where they're ready to learn that skill of doing it on their own right and that's how they did it in the Baroque period and they did more of a holistic musical development at that time as well like a lot of these people that played also could compose they could also sing they could they knew how to fix up instruments everybody could at least play some keyboard and do a little improv so Uh, Not stand-up comedy. I mean, like, improvisation. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But that kind of holistic Renaissance man type of um, character that they were developing within themselves is not how things went after this. Past Beethoven, people started specializing. And that's great, because then you've got, like, a violinist who's better than anyone before that has ever been, and new developments in all kinds of things. But then you've got, like, people who are just a composer or just a cellist or just a singer and that's just not how they used to be in the baroque era in the baroque era you maybe had some specialties but you needed to be able to direct music from your seat and you needed to be able to fix an instrument and you need to be able to teach a voice lesson on the same day as you write out some continual parts for church 
You needed to be able to do all this stuff, and knowing how to do all this stuff was what made some of these musicians' discipline so great. And that's why Bach wrote so much music, and that's why all of it is at a certain level of quality. You know, it's all it, that's all related. That's that's so true. And I mean, these Brandenburg concertos, they are, they are widely considered to be like the top examples of basically instrumental Baroque music yeah. that there is, I think. I mean, I don't think that's crazy to say that. Oh, no, that's absolutely true. It, and there's six of them, and they're all spectacular. They're all very high quality, just like we've always talked about. And one thing I want to bring up, too, about this third movement, just like in a musical way, we talked a little bit about how Baroque music is like rock and roll. And in this, well, besides the fact that it's like just fast and they're just shredding, you know, like it's just, it's amazing to watch it and hear it and the technicality of it reminds you of just like really, really great guitarists. Yeah. But also just the idea of these rhythmic layers, these two different rhythmic layers. Like it starts out with the violin one doing the like faster layer, like this da 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 And during that, the violas are doing the slower rhythmic layer, which is the dun 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 dun. And so, as you listen to the piece, the whole thing is like built on those two layers. Sometimes the instruments are doing the dun 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 dun, dun which is which is like a triplet, like three notes to every beat. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then the other ones are doing the fast ones, which are the sextuplets, six notes to every beat. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. You also have some times where, like, especially in the bass instruments, where they just have one note per beat. One, 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 like that. But otherwise, that's kind of like what's happening typically with the rhythms. That's kind of a, a rock thing too, especially in the drums. Like, there's no drums in this, but the rhythm, the rhythmic vitality of it is similar to drums and how you'd have the different layers of rhythm on the drum set. Like you could have the hi-hat doing the fast, like tss, 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 tss. actually that's the slow one that we talked about before, right? But then you could have the kick drum on the beats like Tew. and then the snare drum on the back beat like Tew. K. Tew. K. And then you've got the hi-hat doing the, the triplets. It's like tss, tss. Something like that. Yeah. And then with those six tuplets, maybe sometimes the hi-hat would do those like... <laughs> or something like that. And all these little layers, you would, as a drummer, you would find ways to incorporate all those layers with the different instruments you have right in front of you on, of the drum set. And here, Bach spreads out those layers in all the different string instruments. And the tempo that this performance takes is oh, yeah. crazy. I love it. Yeah, speed metal, man. Yeah. So our favorite moment is a moment that we think, we like to say, was Bach's part. Because we know he led from the viola sometimes. And we see a couple of times in this movement a very prominent short solo that features the first viola. And our favorite iteration happens two times because there is a repeat. And... It is this section right here. This one gets bonus points in my book, by the way, because of the chord progression, which is my favorite. For some reason, I can't explain why. Just love that. Very Baroque sounding, very expressive chord progression there. Bass lines moving. Bum, 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 bum. Me. Fa, sol, la, mi, fa, sol, do. That kind of thing is yeah. so nice. It's very nice. And it's just to get a little technical, there's only two different chords. It's the first chord is a chord built on C. The second chord is a chord built on F. The third chord is a chord built on C. And the fourth chord is a chord built on F again. So even though those bass notes do change, like the chords themselves technically are just two different chords. 
the chord that's built on C and the chord that's built on F. And composers just do this thing with the bass note sometimes, where they move it by step up or down. But even though they're doing that, it's just like, it's such a pleasing thing because what they're really doing is rearranging the notes so that the chords are really just a couple of different chords, maybe only two or three different chords that are being shuffled around. But the bass line gets to do all this movement because you don't have to put the root in the bass, which means like if you have a C chord, a chord that's supposed to be built with C as its root, you don't have to put the C in the bass. Composers typically do when they're starting or ending a piece or a cadence, but Baroque composers found a lot of freedom in, in that um, based on the rules that they use to have inversions, which means that that bass note is different than the root. And it's just something you hear a lot. And this in this part we love, we're hearing most of the chords in inversions there. Three out of the four of them are inverted. So for those of you who experience uh, music and know of it and maybe write it using chords, this is probably like the hardest pill to swallow in terms of technical language. Uh, about classical music and Baroque music by extension. And that's the idea that chords do not have to be the same as their bass note. Yeah, right? and in jazz, they call this slash chords. So like C over E. C, a slash, and then an E. And it just means it's a C chord, which is made up of C, E, and G. And it means that the E is on the bottom. Right, so if you wrote a song on the guitar that had a C, C chords and G chords and that's it. It was just a two chord song then the thing that matters is that that one chord is C and that the other chord is G. And if a bass player played with you, they'd probably play a C for the C chord and a G for the G chord. But the fact is, is that in earlier music like this, it wasn't like that. It was like that in the most basic of situations. But in a lot of situations, the bass note was another one of the notes of the chord, not the, not the one that is associated with the name of that chord. In other words, not the root. So... That's a very um, that's a very different thing in earlier music. But the thing the thing that I like to do is to not think of it that way at all because they didn't. Right? They didn't think of things like in terms of chords all the time. By box time, he definitely was thinking about chords a lot of the time. But he was in a very large transitory period of music history, where hundreds of years before him, they didn't think of chords at all. They thought of consonant and beautiful sounding intervals only. That's all they thought about. They thought about the lowest note and then how far away were the notes above it. And they didn't think C major chord. They thought C and then let's put a third above that and let's put a fifth above it as well. And that's how they that's how chords came about. It wasn't the other way around. Intervals came first. And that's something that we sometimes have to think about in our modern era cuz now we just think about chords. We just think yeah. like especially if you play the guitar, you're thinking about chords. Chords are kind of like our life now, but we have to open our minds a little bit. Yeah, when you analyze music of Bach and other contemporaries and you put chords in it, it's not wrong. Yeah, there are chords being played if you look at it vertically, right? But it's not all how they would have thought of it. And we've talked before about figured bass or I don't know if we called it that before, but it's the basso continuo line where you'd see the bass part and then the harpsichordist knows what chords to play. Well, the reason they know is not because they see a note and then they see it that it says C chord above it. The reason they know is that they see a note and it has a number above it, or a couple of numbers, and the numbers tell them the intervals of the notes to play above the bass note, and that's all it is. Yeah, and if some... they, yeah, if they saw a C and there was no numbers, then they knew that it was understood that the intervals were three and five, which is just a regular intervals in a chord. And if they saw the numbers four and six, then they'd play that, and then they'd play C, F, and A. And it doesn't say F chord on there, but if you analyze that later, you go, oh yeah, I guess that's an F chord. But that's not how they would have thought of it. They just thought of intervals. No, and it sounds complicated, but to them it was actually so uncomplicated that sometimes those figures, those numbers to tell you what intervals to play above were not even necessary because this music was so repetitive in so so many certain ways that some composers didn't even bother putting those numbers in. All they did was handed the harpsichordist a single bass line. Sometimes they didn't even give him any more tips than that. <laughs> isn't, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but isn't there uh, Vivaldi one time where he... He had the basso continuo part written out, and then begrudgingly he wrote out the the figured bass numbers, and he wrote on there like for the idiots. <laughs> like he was so just like, ugh, if these people don't know how to do this on their own. Yeah, you so would have funny. expected to just pretty much know the twists and turns of how the music was supposed to be harmonized. But yeah, well, I mean, and 
and looking at it now, it, it is hard for people, even who are classically trained, like maybe, let's say like a classical pianist or something. Like if you play classical romantic piano music, you still might, even, even like your, your best classical musicians out there that play piano, they, they probably don't know how to do figured bass. No, this would require special training nowadays. Yeah, this is a specialist thing that these Baroque ensembles can do because they, it's, it's what they do. Like Netherlands Bach Society, they do it because it's, it's a Baroque thing. And you have to learn how to do it. And you're doing some improv about the voicings of these chords, like exactly which octaves you're going to play these notes in, even though the specific notes are specified for you. But it's hard. It's hard to do that, especially on the fly. It's really hard without a lot of training. Yeah, let's not take for granted that the Netherlands Bach Society, which is like a performance practice group, has to have an additional layer of training in order to go and get and figure out how to play these old instruments, because almost all of them are playing on period instruments. Yeah. Violins with gut strings and Baroque bows, which are different and in many ways more difficult to play than the modern instruments. And then they got to learn all of these nuances of the performance practice of 18th century music, which is what I think makes them so great. Yeah, and they play on these excellent instruments, which have in many cases been restored. And and they just look, some, some of these instruments, the look of them is just so amazingly ornate because they're Baroque instruments from that era. I mean, we think of Baroque as meaning that. I mean, like the Baroque art and, the, and architecture is ornate. It's part of the character of that era. So you see these instruments and you see them being played. It's visual marvel as well as an auditory one. Yeah, and the music reflects that. Yeah. And now, here is Bach's viola solo from the third movement of Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3. If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to hear the rest of this piece, please see the link in the episode description to see the performance of Brandenburg 3 by the Netherlands Bach Society. If you want to hear our new episodes as we release them, find us on your podcast app and hit subscribe. Check out our Facebook, Instagram, and website. Thanks for sticking with us for our first mini-series. This was kind of fun, and I think uh, we'll do something like this again in the yeah. future. Um, and just a thank you to you, the listener, for being with us here. We're really happy to have seen our listenership grow a little bit in the past month or so. And we love it if you just keep telling your friends about the podcast. And one thing that's really great is if you just give us a review, because that lets people know uh, what we're all about. Yeah. Okay, Christian. What are we going to be looking at next week? We'll be looking at the chorale Christus der ist mein Leben, BWV 282. Until next time, enjoy those moments. 